All right, Alan and I are here, and we've got a story about French fiber optics, but I'm going to start with a few other ones. Um, a company called Revise wants to add programming to NFTs. Normal NFTs are just pictures, and you buy a sort of receipt on the blockchain to prove that you're the official owner of the picture. Um, but now they're going to add programming so it does things. And the idea is these would now be game pieces you can use in games, although the problem is blockchain games are sort of horrible because you have to wait for a block time for your move to take effect. And they're having plans to use uh, side chains and stuff to speed that up. But anyway, we may have uh, game pieces that contain code that are sold as NFTs. India has passed a real extreme data retention law saying that to improve incident response, everybody has to report cyber incidents within six hours. And companies like VPNs and other providers have to keep strict records of who all the customers are to facilitate uh, tracing down cyber incidents. So that sounds like the kind of stuff the FBI has wanted in America for many years, but they've never been able to pass. And Google is launched something called Sandbox Developer Preview for Pixel, which is their attempt to limit the amount of uh, intrusion from ads. They do not want to be as extreme as Apple and block ad tracking, but they want ads to all run in sort of a little sandbox container so the code in ads can't interact with the code outside ads, which sounds like a pretty good idea. And then Alan's got the big one about fiber optics. Yeah, this is a really big story and unprecedented in my recall. In France, there appears to have been uh, an effort at sabotaging fiber optic internet cables. And um, this has resulted in multiple ISPs going down for several hours um, and actually seeing diminished performance for days or over a day. Um, mm -hmm. this, has not, this story has not got a lot of attention but the French government is already investigating this as an act of sabotage, not vandalism, but sabotage. And uh, some person on the internet uh, going by the handle of free underscore 1337 on Twitter has posted four photos of underground pole boxes with fiber optic cables cut, neatly cut. And hmm. um, I mean, this is not a lot of information to go off of, but you can see that uh, somebody knew where these boxes were and they, they're not very large. They would probably go unnoticed on the sidewalks of San Francisco um, and apparently not very well secured either. Uh, there's hmm. some mention of these boxes being uh, next to rail lines, which is often where long distance fiber optic runs because of uh, uh, you know, just uh, how these uh, land use works in most countries. And uh, it does appear that somebody has opened up these boxes and they had the proper tools to cut the cables. They didn't use like uh, hedge trimmers or bolt cutters. They actually used proper fiber optic cutters and they severed the lines inside of these boxes. And this resulted in the internet connections between Paris and uh, Strasbourg and Lyon and Lee, I believe, all being uh, degraded, not completely severed, but significantly degraded. Uh, latency shot way up. Um, and uh, as far as I know, the system still has not fully recovered. But this was not targeting a particular company. This was uh, affected many companies, uh, ISPs all at the same time but not all of them. So it's not like the whole internet has gone down, but it has been significantly degraded. Sounds like it would be pretty easy to detect and fix. Well, you would think that it'd be easy to detect and to fix, but it has taken them quite a while to fully recover from this. Hmm. And uh, um, repairing fiber after all is not a simple process. And it does result in the, if you try to uh, just join it back together again, splice it back together again, uh, it weakens the signal. So it does reduce the performance. So I'm not sure exactly how they're going to replace it, but it does get me thinking that, um, you know, DDoS attacks are 
nowadays they still happen. In fact, there is a very, very large one that uh, Cloudflare just reported, the biggest ever. Um, but the technologies for mitigating those DDoS attacks is pretty good. So those attacks never succeed for very long, if at all. Whereas a physical attack like this, this is much harder to defend against because um, you know yeah. there's just so much of that cable out there. And um, it's also harder to potentially harder to identify the person responsible for it if they're any good at what they're doing. I suppose it doesn't seem like anybody benefits from this, though. I don't see any motive. Ah, well, this is where things get more interesting. Uh, of course, the speculation online immediately goes to uh, Russia and France's increased involvement in supplying weapons, including some heavy weapons, to Ukraine. Well, in that case, you would want to leave a note or somehow make it clear what you're doing it for. <laughs> if it's an act of political terrorism, you have to explain the purpose. <laughs> well, not necessarily. I, I would say not necessarily, because yeah. um, speculation is powerful enough. And sometimes you don't want your attacks to be uh, traceable or to be verifiable even, uh, or attributable. For example, uh, getting back to that war between Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine has executed a number of uh, sabotage attacks, uh, blowing up various facilities in Russia. And well, yet, yeah. The Ukrainians have been very careful not to take credit for those attacks. No, I saw that. They say, gee, it must be karma. But that's yes. a different issue. I mean, they clearly benefit from that. I mean, it's not clear to me that the Russians benefit from slowing down the internet in Paris for a while. <laughs> Well, they, they benefit just as much as they would uh, conducting cyber attacks of other kinds. Yeah, that's why again, cyber attacks themselves don't really accomplish anything. And that's why, you know, they're typically used in conjunction with kinetic attacks, which is what's been going on in your train. Well, I think that does accomplish uh, uh, essentially terrorist functions. And yeah. it, it serves as a warning. You know, we can do this much to you now at the, your level of participation currently, or if you decide to escalate your support for Ukraine, who knows what kinds of mischief we'll be able to execute in the future. Well, I guess, okay. But that would seem like you'd at least need to take credit for it. Unless you think the, uh, the government executives have got the message and you don't need the public to know. Yeah, this is also 4D chess. I'm sure that the intelligence agencies know more than they're going to say publicly. And uh, so this may be their way of communicating with each other, shall we say. That sounds like the Russians and the Chinese, but emphatically not the Americans. I remember all the Chinese trying to decode Trump statements and find hidden messages like that, and they were pretty frustrated. Well, there are smarter people in the U.S. government than Trump, and I'm sure they are more than capable of playing more complicated games. I imagine. Well, anyway, I've got a few more. Goldman is offering a Bitcoin-backed loan. So that is the closest anyone's got to one of the major uh, banks participating directly in cryptocurrency. They're all going there gradually. And China is going to end their regulatory storm crushing big tech, which is a big thing. And you may remember about a year ago, China apparently got fed up with all the billionaires in America running the place and said, we're not gonna allow that in China. And they just crushed them. The head of Alibaba vanished for months. All they withdrew their um, stock offerings they were gonna make. They basically crushed their tech sector. And now the problem is because of all the COVID lockdowns, they have a serious economic crisis. So now they say they're gonna let the tech sector grow more to try to bring some life back to the economy. But uh, I think just like we were saying with that subtle message with the cable, uh, the, the tech sectors got their message that they better not start getting big enough to think they can act like a government the way they do over here. And Microsoft Edge is getting a built-in VPN powered by Cloudflare. So that's a pretty big score for Cloudflare, I suppose. Um, probably a good idea. Students ask me often if they should use a VPN, and I generally say probably not these days, because if you get a commercial VPN, they're pretty much run by the crooks. But getting one going through Cloudflare would probably be okay. And uh, 
The one I thought was interesting, DJI makes these consumer level drones, not military drones, but they're using them for military purposes in Ukraine. And they've been claiming that the signals are encrypted. And then Ukraine complained that people can detect the signals controlling the drones and then bomb us. And it turns out that they were all just lying. They claimed it was encrypted. Uh, expert said it was encrypted because they said it was encrypted. It took a hacker who actually picked up the radio signals and looked at him and said, no, this stuff is not encrypted. And apparently it never has been encrypted. And they've just been lying about that. So uh, they've also stopped selling them in Ukraine because they really don't want people using them for military purposes. Anyway. Uh, it's an interesting situation with DJI. Yeah. Um, they, they've also stopped selling in Russia. Right. Um, but it's not hard for people to buy them elsewhere and then just ship them over. So uh, as apparently many donors have in the case of Ukraine in particular. They've well, Ukraine has all sorts of homemade weapons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, including homemade weapons. But the issue yeah. with DJI drones uh, is not a new one um, in the, the war there. In fact, going back some years, um, I think going back to 2015, 2016, after Russia invaded Ukraine and seized the Donbass or part of the Donbass, um, the uh, uh, Ukrainian defenders were using DGA drones and the Russians figured out how to geolocate the signals from the controllers and then would promptly uh, shell the, the location of the operator and kill the operator. Yeah. So um, if anything, the war has long since moved on past DGA technology, uh, except Russian e electronic warfare has been quite bad and has really underperformed. And so in many forward areas, um, Russia does not, the Russian forces do not have adequate uh, electronic warfare capabilities. And so Ukrainian units can somewhat safely continue to operate their DJI drones. Yes, I imagine. Um, but um, the, the real issue here is that the, the radio signals and the, the system it can be located in the first place. And there are technologies that do exist that allow radios to um, uh, send signals over multiple stations. So you cannot uh, identify the, uh, the exact location of the operator. Um, and that's what more advanced systems use. You know, Elon Musk said when he gave them all those Starlink terminals, he said, you know, they can detect these, so you better be careful and not use them too much. And I never heard of them getting bombed. No, there was um, briefly some success by the Russian forces in jamming Starlink signals, but then Starlink fixed that problem. Mm. And apparently there are thousands in the field. Yeah, uh, and they've been used very effectively. There, there isn't too much attention paid to this, but apparently the, the Ukrainian forces really uh, attribute a lot of their success to Starlink and how Starlink has um, really kept their communication lines up and available to them. Yeah, I mean, this is another case in which Elon Musk has a pretty strong argument that he's done a lot of good things, like he was picking on uh, Bill Gates saying, you know, you must not be serious about the environment if you're going to bet against Tesla. And that's why, you know, everyone on Twitter is all the liberals are freaking out. I'm inclined to give Elon Musk a chance because he's got a pretty good argument saying he's done some good stuff to balance his bad stuff. Well, you can say this about anyone. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of all the good things Trump did and not pulling up a long list. <laughs> that's true. I, I think Elon <laughs> Musk has really done some really significant good things, far more than most people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that in, in Musk's case, uh, his good deeds have been more incidental than uh, planned well in advance. And the, the, the fact of the matter is the, the guy, um, from an ideological standpoint, is highly inconsistent. And that's a charitable way of putting it. Oh, sure, sure. He's just sort of playing at life. That's usually the case with the nobility class. <laughs> yes, he's definitely playing at life. This is what kings usually do. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, so let's go on to you. You've got uh, Russia's criminal network. Yes, this is a, a, an article by Mark Galliato, um, Galliati, excuse me, former uh, visiting fellow at European Council on Foreign Relations. 
And uh, I bring this up because in part of my last story about these severed fiber optic cables in France mm -hmm. um, and the, all the rumors online about how Russian intelligence was behind it. Now, of course, that's entirely speculation. It's internet rumors, so you shouldn't take that seriously. But one thing I've always wondered about is uh, Russia's, Russia, the Russian government's and Russian intelligence's use of organized crime to accomplish its goals. And um, this article, which was published in 2017, uh, answers some of those questions that I had. It's a long one. Uh, so very briefly, what I'll say is that um, um, Russian intelligence and the Russian government does make use of Russian organized crime. Um, and that the, according to Galeati, the Russian state itself is highly criminalized, which shouldn't come as a surprise given how the oligarchs were able to accrue such massive wealth and also uh, leaders of the Russian government such as Vladimir Putin himself have gotten extraordinarily wealthy uh, by essentially plundering the state. Yeah. But, um, what this article does focus on is how the Russian organized crime has shifted from more or less street level activities in the 1990s, in which case they were oftentimes trying to supplant local organized crime organizations in various European countries throughout Europe, uh, Western, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and they've instead acted more like facilitators and suppliers, and they've become more strategic um, in their dealings. They're, they're no longer wasting their time with street level dealings. Um, and also that these organized crime groups have been particularly useful for laundering cash or providing black, what's called black cash that can then be funneled to Russian intelligence operations. And that money is totally untraceable because the money was sourced through illegal means in the first place. And there's also a paragraph or two about cyber attacks and how uh, cyber attacks figure into this. There, there have long been rumors about how organized groups use um, or, or have uh, actually a cyber uh, crime component to them and that many of these cyber, cyber criminals are in fact working on behalf of these larger gangs. And it, it, although the Russian government has its own uh, hacking departments at the FSB and the, the SVG and the GRU, um, the, these groups do provide some important functions in terms of surge capacity when extra support is needed or when attribution or a difficulty in providing attribution is extra important. So um, all in all, this uh, report, which goes through a lot of uh, incidents, including um, and includes some information from interviews with organized crime figures, as well as uh, government officials and even some, some spooks, is, is pretty insightful. Um, and it does give a lot of background into how the Russian state has benefited from these organized crime organizations. Mm -hmm. All right. Now I've got a few more here. Um, so Alexa is listening all the time to you to talk. And now they have discovered that despite what Amazon says, they are using what you give Alexa to target ads. And they're selling what you say to Alexa to third parties, like 50 other ad ad targeting agencies. And uh, Amazon tried to deny this. And then they tried to say, well, they don't actually get your voice. They just get the words we harvested from your voice to use to target ads. But anyway, um, people did it the way I would like to do it, just by experiment. They made a series of fake personas. And then they would talk to their Alexa and pretend to be interested in like baby products and then other products, and then wait and see what ads they get. And they found that their ads they got all over the place on other sites, on computers connected to the same network and stuff were all affected by the data fed into Alexa. So that is something uh, that I've heard people say for years, that if you talk around your phone, your phone picks it up. And I don't know about your phone, but it's certainly true of Alexa. 
It's and, just amazing to me that um, Amazon was able to lie about this for so long and get away with it, and there aren't really any consequences. No, and there aren't any consequences. Google has done nothing but lie about their ad tracking forever and pretend they've anonymized it when they haven't and pretend they've deleted it when they haven't. So has Facebook. It's standard in the industry. It seems so, but you'd think that GDPR at least would force them to change their ways. Well, it might be. I think GDPR is beginning to have a few lawsuits about these things, uh, but uh, it's only in its infancy. And there's a, a cute Twitter thread from a guy in talking about forensics. So I didn't know this. If you're running a process on Linux and you no longer have the binary that launched it, there is an I, there is a directory that has a copy of the, the on hard disk of every running process. You can just go there and harvest it. And you can just go there and launch another instance of a running process. Uh, it keeps a temporary copy of that. So that's cute to know. I was thinking you'd have to use a tool like on Windows, it's Lord PE that will take the memory image and dump it down to disk, but you don't even need to do that. And there's a fun YouTube video, um, an infographic video saying what's wrong with Russian's military, about 20 minutes long, that goes through what's going on in Ukraine with Russia being such complete fools. And it had a lot of interesting stuff that I didn't know, like um, Russia, Russian armor, those armored vehicles are supposed to have ceramic armor, uh, which is what the best stuff is these days. But instead, it has the holder, and what's inside there is just egg cartons. And the soldiers are supposed to have flak vests, but the panels of Kevlar are in fact just cardboard because of the immense corruption in the Russian military. People have just been making fake stuff that looked good and pocketing the money. And I already heard about the tires are just going flat on their vehicles because they didn't rotate them. They didn't turn the vehicles around so the sun damage would all be on one side. And um, they also, they don't understand how to do basic strategy. They'll have a bunch of tanks all bunched together going single file down a road. So it's easy for them to just target one and clog up the road. And they don't have infantry walking next to the armored vehicles, the tanks, which are supposed to, if a tank is going along, they're supposed to have infantry soldiers going through the brushes and two buildings on the side to make sure there's nobody there shooting an anti-tank weapon at them. And they just don't do that. They've got videos of them walking and doing it wrong and getting killed and many, many other similar things. So it's um, an interesting, list of, of it have shows like basic American military manuals, and it shows the Russians doing everything wrong. But of course, they, they've always been like this. They've always been completely incompetent and foolish, but they use a lot of long range artillery and just target civilian areas and, and win by just slaughtering everyone, which is what they're doing in Ukraine. And the last one I was surprised at, which I had, I didn't find it in the American source, but I found an Australian source. They say blood samples show three in four American children have already had COVID. And so I think now, that's why Anthony Fauci is talking about it. We passed out of the pandemic phase into another phase. And I think we have, um, almost everybody's had COVID. <laughs> children and adults, they've either had the vaccine or COVID or both. Um, but there are consequences. There are serious consequences. And this is getting back to that old argument about building the immunity wall. Yeah. And uh, this was the strategy pursued in many countries. Um, I shouldn't say many, but in some countries. Yeah, herd immunity, yeah. Yeah, herd immunity. And Sweden in particular was really fixated on building the immunity wall and reaching herd immunity. And that strategy didn't work because people can get reinfected. Yeah. And that's exactly what's happened is that it turns out that uh, the virus mutates pretty quickly and it mutates in such a way that um, the results can be very different. It's not like the flu virus where yes, there are some strains of influenza that are definitely more lethal than others. Um, and flu also incidentally does mutate faster, but um, COVID mutates in ways that make it more unpredictable um, and cause reinfection very, very quickly. So we're getting these waves every six months. That's been the pattern so far. Every six months, there's a new variant that comes through. And a lot of people get sick with that, that variant. And people have gotten sick two, three times. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, Nicole Perwoff just put on Twitter that she got uh, pericarditis from it, which is very painful. Oh, yeah, and inflammation of, uh, 
a membrane around the heart. Yeah, and that's known true. to come from COVID. Yeah. So she, uh, I think it, we probably should just adopt what my uh, Chinese students do. And what she everywhere in China. In China, people just wear masks a lot. You should just continue to like wear masks when you go indoors someplace uh, into the indefinite future. Well, a lot of countries in East Asia adopted masking uh, after the first um, SARS. SARS epidemic. Yeah. And um, that seemed a bit ridiculous, I, I think, to uh, North American and, and European uh, sensibilities, medical sensibilities. But it's turning out that, that really is a very effective approach. Yeah. The only problem with that masking is the masks have to be high quality because uh, COVID is so infectious. It's getting every single variant is more infectious than the last. And uh, even with Omicron, BA2, which was the second subvariant, was 30% more infectious than BA1, the original Omicron yep. subvariant. And now there's a BA2.12, I think it is. And that's even like 30% more infectious than BA2. And I think even the first Omicron was the most infectious disease there's ever been. No, not quite. No, less measles, infectious than measles. Oh, measles is still worse? Okay. Yeah, measles Measles has an R naught of up to uh, R16. Oh. So one person can spread it to 16 others on average. So we have and, something to look forward to. Yes, yes. So I don't think Omicron uh, BA2.12 uh, is quite to the measles level yet, but it's above chickenpox and it's above pretty much everything else, I think. So it's just about there. It's getting very close to measles level. Um, and uh, measles is a bad one, but I think COVID has an argument for being worse in many ways. So the, yeah, the well, I've still got my mask. Yeah, and, the, and masks make a big difference. Masks make a big difference. Well, also, the only mask. thing you can do easily, other than yeah, that, yeah. vaccination. Right, and vaccinations really, they're not very effective after three months. The, the e efficacy goes down by at least half. Well, I think they still remain effective against severe disease and death, but not against right. symptomatic disease. And even that is pretty annoying. That, that's right. And, and the symptomatic infection is still a problem because of long COVID. Right. And um, it's difficult to pin down the statistics of just uh, what percentage of people infected uh, post-vaccination develop long COVID, but it's at least 5%. Oh, yeah, I see bigger numbers like 30%. Yes, right. And depending on the study, it goes up to 30 or even 50%. Yeah, so you um, really don't want to catch it. No, you really don't. And uh, unfortunately, it's getting harder and harder not to, obviously, since three quarters of all kids have already got it. And um, I think over 60% of all Americans have got it already. And, and uh, the president's going to the White House Correspondents' Dinner even though the last similar event was a super spreader and Fauci <laughs> said he's not going because it's too crazy, but 2000 people indoors having dinner in Washington and Washington seems to be the center of all these super spreaders. Yeah. Cause I guess politicians get together and talk so much. I don't know, but there've been yeah, so right. many super spreader events in Washington. It's all that hot air, but you know, the next thing is we're going to have Trump running for president and all those rallies again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, keep your mask. Hey, well, you've got one about dogs. Yeah, this is a fun story, finally. No, no more depressing news. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, always, I think, been the stereotype about certain dogs behaving certain ways. You know, certain breeds are known for being good with children and others for being bad with children. Certain breeds are very yappy and others are quiet, et cetera, et cetera. And although there may be some truth to some of those behaviors, uh, this study shows that uh, on average, the breed explains only 9% of the behavioral differences between individual dogs. That's and, hard to believe. I mean, well, <laughs> the anecdotal evidence I, I've heard would make me expect more like 80%. Well, that's right. That's right. And, and so what uh, geneticist uh, Eleanor, Eleanor Carlson of the University of Massachusetts has done is taken a big survey, internet survey, of dogs. And by the way, the sampling was not the best. 
uh, I believe the way that people and dogs were recruited for this survey was that they were directed to a website and they would just fill out questions. A lot of questions. Um, and this, this is a database known as Darwin's Ark. And they got uh, over 18,000 pet owners to respond to surveys about uh, their dogs' traits and behaviors. Um, and uh, they had a bunch of, of different uh, uh, behaviors that they were asking about uh, uh, over a hundred. And they also um, got uh, genetic uh, data from um, uh, over 2000 dogs. Hmm. So the owners sent in saliva samples. Hmm. So they were able to collect not only these behavioral observations from owners, but they also got genetic data from them. Um, both purebred dogs and uh, mutt dogs. And this is important because they were then able to match up the reported traits and behaviors of the dogs to the genes of the dogs. And because they had a collection of both purebred and mutt dogs, they were able to try to identify which genes were responsible for which behaviors. And what they found is that the breed is not a reliable predictor of individual behavior. Hmm. So certain dogs indeed do like to play fetch and retrieve things like retrievers because they were bred to do that. Mm -hmm. And other dogs um, uh, don't like to howl or do like to howl. And so th that's also a, a selected behavior. Um, but uh, things like the yappiness of small dogs, that apparently is uh, not so much uh, founded uh, in, in, in any genetics. Oh, okay. Instead, what the authors speculate is that the human stereotypes about dog behavior and dog breeds causes the humans to socialize them differently. And so a large dog might not be able to get away with barking all the time, whereas a small dog is allowed to, and that thus solidifies its behavior and its temperament. I guess that's possible. They certainly can learn and they try hard to please their owners. Yeah, yeah. So it's in some ways, the study says um, more about the humans who own these dogs than about the dogs than the individual dogs themselves. All right. Well, that's it for this one. And we'll be back on Tuesday.